Battlefront 2 was released this past weekend. Like all Star Wars stories, the campaign mode has plenty of Easter eggs, references, and connections with the rest of the Star Wars galaxy. Right up front, I actually want to say the writers of the story, Mitch Dyer and Walt Williams, did a fantastic job of making sure the story here fit in perfectly with other events we've seen in previous stories. It's a straight-up love letter to the canon universe outside of the films. I'll be covering all of the easter eggs and references I caught, and of course, there will be spoilers for the game ahead. Starting in the prologue mission, Iden's droid is an ID-10 Seeker droid. It's a step up from the ID-9 droids used by the Seventh Sister in Star Wars Rebels. You can spy on a transmission from Admiral Akbar that says Rebel ships are gathering in the Galan system to divert Imperial attention away from the Rebel fleet gathering at Sullust to attack the second Death Star. The events at the Galan system, codenamed Operation Yellow Moon, are detailed in the book Moving Target. There's a dossier on Iden written in Arabesh on the ship. Translated, it reads, Identity, Iden Versio. Born, Kestro Vardos Genata System. Affiliations, Galactic Empire, Special Forces, Inferno Squad. Intelligence, Expert Pilot, Marksman, Special Forces Training. Survived the Job Bess Incursion. Captured at, Classified Location, Status, Extremely Dangerous, Examination, Incomplete. The Corvus is a Raider-class Corvette, first introduced to Star Wars by the X-Wing Miniatures game. I believe this was its first appearance in any actual Star Wars story, canon, or legends. On board the ship, Iden and Dell recall their experiences on the Jabez incursion, which was mentioned in the dossier. Moving on to the Battle of Endor mission, after the destruction of the second Death Star, Admiral Versio says Vice Admiral Sloan ordered an Imperial retreat. He is referring to Rey Sloan, who took control of the fleet after the death of Admiral Piet. She has appeared in multiple books, short stories, and comics, and achieved the rank of Grand Admiral during the Aftermath trilogy. You can see her point of view of the Battle of Endor in the short story, The Levers of Power. We see U-Wings landing more rebel troops across the moon who begin attacks on other Imperial outposts. This ties in with the Shattered Empire comic, where the fighting on Endor did not end even after the Ewok party. Up in space, Iden mentions the fact that Inferno Squad was created to avoid something like the destruction of the Death Star happening again. According to the book Inferno Squad, the team was created in response to the Battle of Yavin. In the meeting with Dadmiral Versio, we get to hear Palpatine's message from the Sentinel droid. The message and the concept of the messenger droid first appeared in the Shattered Empire comic. The exact lines are used here in the game. Admiral Versio. Operation Cinder is to begin at once. Resistance, rebellion, defiance. These are concepts that cannot be allowed to persist. You are but one of many tools by which these ideas shall be burned away. Heed my messenger. He shall relay you. The droid tells Iden she is not verified. In the comic, we see that message receivers were required to verify their identity with blood. The planet Fondor was already canon, but this is its first canon on-screen appearance. In Legends, it was known as a research and development hub for experimental technology. That's still true here since the Operation Cinder satellites come from the station. The Star Destroyer at Fondor is named the Dauntless, which is the same Star Destroyer that was seen in Rogue One hovering above Jeddah City. The TL-50 heavy repeater used by Iden in the mission was first created for the Jedi Knight series of games back in Legends. The mission on Pilio involves one of the Emperor's observatories. According to the Aftermath trilogy, Palpatine had a number of observatories scattered throughout the galaxy. One of them was on Jakku and was used to send expeditions into the unknown regions. The one on Pilio seems to just be a storage facility. The observatory is protected by a mantle defense system. The Jakku observatory also had some sort of self-destruct. I don't know if the systems are the same, but thought it was worth mentioning. The compass found by Luke was mentioned in the Legends of Luke Skywalker book. In that story, someone gives a man he thinks is Luke Skywalker a compass he found in a box marked Pilio. That book is purposefully incorrect, telling tall tales about Luke. I believe it's just an incorrect origin story of the compass, and the game tells the true version. Before setting foot on Vardos, we get to see the Cinder satellites in action. 
Again, they were first shown in Shattered Empire, and they are climate disruptors, so they create insanely strong storms that will tear cities to the ground. Next is more of a nice detail than an easter egg, but Aiden and Del exit the Corvus without their helmets, while Gideon is seen wearing his already. This foreshadows their doubts about what's going on. After their defection, Del and Aiden completely abandon their helmets. The mission on the planet has a number of connections with the Inferno Squad book. Gleb appears as Aiden's former teacher. The history behind the Dadmiral statue is given. Aiden's mother is revealed to be a propaganda artist, and it's very possible she actually designed many of the posters seen throughout the city. By the way, translated, they say Stormtrooper Corps enlist today, Versio, Hero of Vardos, a monument to security, and leadership, order, power. Also, the ticker on the wall translates to Enemy of the Empire, Aiden Versio, and Del Miko. Watch for wanted fugitives. And finally, the holographic image of Aiden's face just says locate immediately. Some smaller connections include a Gozanti class freighter dropping off an at, -AT as we've seen in Star Wars Rebels, and the crates strewn about the city are very similar to the orange crates used to transport kyber crystals in Rogue One. At the end of the level, Aiden speaks with a character named Caton, whose full name is Adiana Caton. She is the pilot of the Corvus introduced in the book. After Aiden and Del escape, they mention the possibility that the Rebels will lock them up in Sunspot Prison. That was introduced in the main Star Wars comic, where it was actually destroyed shortly after the Battle of Yavin. So either the Rebels built another one, or Aiden and Del simply don't know about the station's destruction. Or they know and they're making a joke. The hyperspace shot on the way to Naboo is exactly like the one used in Rogue One. The attack itself is yet another scene from Shattered Empire. You can see three N1 starfighters in the fight. They are piloted by Leia, Queen Sharuna of Naboo, and Shara Bay, the mother of Poe Dameron. Although we don't see the ship, Lando and Nine Num are present in Nine Ship, the Mel Crawler 2. I asked the developers about its inclusion, and basically they couldn't make a model for a ship that would only appear in one scene and not in multiplayer, but they were aware that it should be present. So that's good enough for me. The dialogue between Leia and Lando is directly lifted from the third issue of Shattered Empire. All fighters, begin your attack! Lando, your timing couldn't be better. The fight on Naboo's surface is a continuation of the scene in Shattered Empire that wasn't detailed in the comic. Again, we see Gazanti freighters delivering Imperial walkers for the assault. This isn't an easter egg, but I do like that Naboo's defense system is an ion pulse that disables weapons and limits enemy casualties. The mission on Takodana is a goldmine of easter eggs and fun conversation, so we're gonna spend a moment here. First up, let's talk about Han's beard. This takes place sometime between the events of Aftermath and Aftermath Life Debt. In Aftermath, Han and Chewie decide they're going to liberate Kashyyyk. A few months later in Life Debt, Han can be seen with a beard. So they had to give him a beard here too, and his mission on Takodana is directly related to his goal of liberating Kashyyyk. Maz also mentions some of the rules of her castle as set up by some previous stories, including the fact that all deals made inside her walls have to go through her, and there is absolutely no fighting allowed whatsoever. The rest of the easter eggs can be found mostly by listening in on conversations. My favorites are upstairs where you can find two Rebels connections. First is a convoy that flies away if you get too close. Right next to it are a pair of patrons that discuss a strange, tall, purple-haired Wookiee. They're describing a Lasat and possibly Zeb himself. Okay, what else? Big green eyes. And he was sort of... purple. Ah, the rare and legendary Purple Wookiee. You're the worst. Throughout the castle, you can also find a mention of the Zerka Corporation from Knights of the Old Republic. After you left me stranded during the Zerka job? Sky Strike Academy from Rebels. Old flight hours of Sky Strike Academy for what? The New Republic Senate on Chandrilla. The Senate is on Chandrilla. Munyak Wool from the planet Jelukan, which was introduced in Lost Stars. I can get you all the Munyak Wool you want. Oh, and this little astromech serving drinks like R2 on Jabba's sail barge. This protocol droid bartender mentions a couple interesting drinks. Port in a Storm is a fortified wine from the planet Pamarth that was introduced in the novel Bloodline. It had the reputation of bringing even the strongest drinkers to their knees. The other drink is a Hutslayer Splash, which was probably named after Leia, who was known as Hutslayer by some after the events of Return of the Jedi. This one isn't an easter egg really, but the man crying over his missing gonk droid broke my heart. Downstairs you can visit the room where Rey finds Anakin's lightsaber in The Force Awakens. 
You can't go inside, but things get very quiet when you're next to it. A pair of guys upstairs discuss moving cargo for Black Sun, which was first created for Shadows of the Empire in Star Wars Legends, but is still a prominent criminal organization in canon. Han's contact, Paldora, is distinguished by his drink, Maranzane Gold. That was an expensive liquor first created for the Deveronian's Tale in Tales from the Moss Eisley Cantina. Being totally honest here, I would not have caught this one if Mitch didn't point it out to me. That is a deep cut. If you stand near Paldora and don't interact with him, he will continue to say amusing things about Wookiees and Marinzane Gold, including attempting to order the drink in Shriwook. Let's see if I can order a drink in Wookiee speak. Hmm? Paldora himself is a statistician who won't stop talking. My favorite line of his is a claim that most statisticians are killed by apprentice statisticians, which has to be a joke about the Sith and the rule of two, and masters being killed by their apprentices. While you fight, he continues to throw out statistics about the Empire, including the fact that stormtroopers only land 77% of blaster shots. Honestly, that seems like a generous number to me. In the air, he notes that the YT-1300 hyperdrive fails 1.22 times more often than the YT-2400. The 2400 is the same ship model as the Outrider, Dash Rindar's ship from Shadows of the Empire. Paldora also notes that you don't see Arquitan's class command cruisers as much anymore, and I thought that was funny since they're used heavily in Star Wars Rebels, but we never saw them in the original trilogy. After Maz yells at Han for bringing the Empire to her territory, she reassures Chewbacca by saying she doesn't blame him. How could she blame her crush? On the mission to Bespin, Del says there's always more to something than luck. This is an echo of a line delivered by Luke during the Pilio mission, foreshadowing Del's growing belief in the Force. The first part of the level is a flight through Beldens. Del mentions that they create Tabana gas, which is true. They do so by using their tendrils to gather atmospheric plankton and chemicals, which they then convert to the gas. Del mentions wanting to visit the planets Lothal and Mykapo after they've been freed. Lothal is a major location in Star Wars Rebels, and my capo appeared in the Season 3 episode Iron Squadron. While in Stormtrooper disguise, if you go up to the area of Chinook Station labeled Scrap, you can find a cloud car. I didn't talk smack about the ship, which is funny considering you are required to fly one very soon after. A group of Stormtroopers mentioned Governor Adelhard and his Iron Blockade. This is a reference to the plot of the Star Wars Uprising mobile game. Adelhard locked down the Anoit sector where Bespin is located and attempted to keep his people from learning that the Emperor was dead. The whole thing fell apart and the sector was lost, but it would appear that this mission takes place before the Empire was overthrown. On Solist, Lando kinda gets to deliver the I have a bad feeling about this line by asking Shriv if he has a bad feeling. Later, Shriv mentions being involved in the events of the book Battlefront Twilight Company when he says he played a part in the liberation of the planet. The Battle of Jakku has a number of easter eggs, although not as many as Takodana. Right off the bat, Shriv says Karabast, the favorite swear word of Zeb that was also used by Pow in Rogue One. This is more of a new fact than an easter egg, but Iden's droid serves as her astromech in her X-Wing. I don't know if we've seen a modification on an astromech socket like that before. A rebel captain mentions being shot down while trying to reach Carbon Ridge. Iden and Shriv help him get airborne again so he can assault the location. Aftermath Empire's End tells us there was a secret Imperial research base that was located there. One segment requires you to call in airstrikes from Starhawk Command, and Starhawk Unity actually does the orbital bombardment. The Starhawk-class battleship was created for Aftermath Empire's End, and Unity is a ship also mentioned in the book. I was hoping we'd actually get to see the Starhawks on screen in the game, but I don't think Lucasfilm is ready to define their exact look. So far, all we know is that they are hatchet-shaped battleships. Com Chatter mentions Phantom Squadron, Wedge, and Snap Wexley, all of whom were present at the Battle of Jakku in Empire's End. Phantom Squadron, inbound on the Empire's ground defenses. Wedge, Snap, take out those cannons and keep us clear of the stars. We're working on getting the Ravager out of this fight. You can also hear them mention trying to take the Ravager out of the fight. That's the Super Star Destroyer Ray and Finn flew the Falcon through in The Force Awakens. I would have missed this one if it weren't for Twitter users Kurt Katarn and Thor Von Blitz, but even more com chatter gives us a direct reference to the events of the book Lost Stars and one of its main characters, Thane Kyrell. Please confirm that destroyer is on a deliberate crash course with the surface. Confirm. We have operatives on that vessel. 
Send a recovery team to its target vector. Affirmative, Command. Who are we looking for? Idel and Kyrell. Lieutenants behind enemy lines. Affirmative. We'll find your boys. The Star Destroyer mentioned in that sequence is the Inflictor, which happens to be this Star Destroyer from The Force Awakens. Aboard the Eviscerator, the Dadmiral says Rax expects him to leave. First of all, that's a reference to Gallius Rax, who was leading the Empire at that point in time. Most of the Empire was purposefully destroyed in the Battle of Jakku, but a select group of those deemed worthy were given a set of coordinates into the unknown regions. Versio was invited, but chooses to go down with his ship and the Empire instead. Jumping nearly three decades into the future, the final mission is a trip into the memories of Del Mico. As Kylo Ren invades his mind, we get a few nods to the Inferno Squad book. We run through Scarif first because the book says that Del was once a shore trooper there before moving on to a career in engineering. There are a couple of lines we can hear that were from Inferno Squad's first official meeting in which they offer a toast to Admiral Versio. I toast Admiral Versio. This mission is supposed to take place at about the same time as the Poe Dameron comic. Both Poe and Kylo are searching for Lor Santeca and the map to Luke Skywalker at the same time. We see Gleb again, and she has four eyes now instead of two. I guess that means Aqualish grow more eyes as they age. Del and Aiden are said to have had a daughter, and this isn't an easter egg, but I'm sure I'll get a billion questions if I don't address it. Could that daughter be Rey? I mean, yeah, there's a slight possibility, but no, I do not think that they are Rey's parents at all. But that's going to bring this video to a close. Again, I want to reiterate how impressed I was with the connective tissue in this game story. It's clear that Mitch and Walt have a passion for Star Wars and a desire to make things fit. As someone that reads every story that comes out, Battlefront 2 was a very rewarding experience. I put both their Twitters in the description, and if you enjoyed the video and their story, please do let them know. I really do believe the work they did deserves some nerd recognition. And before I go, I wanted to mention a friend of mine, Narwhal Dave. He does Battlefront Easter Egg videos all the time, and I'm sure he'll be covering a ton of them on all the multiplayer maps and not just the story mode, so if you like this video, go give him a look. There's a link to his channel in the description too. And finally, I just started my lore play series for Battlefront 2, where I'll be going more in depth into the lore and history behind each mission of the campaign, so you can see the first video in that series right here. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and consider checking out my Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.